That's what I was gonna say. Not all fans, <laughs> no, but like it's the yeah. yeah if you're not going in it for like the hard science, then I'm not going in it for the other thing you feel like Two, four, six, seven. Good. We're set. And you made it up here from the lab. But by, by the way, do you notice that it smells bad in that lab when you walked in there? Oh, okay. You know what? I'm gonna we're gonna talk about that in a second because. That's an indoor air quality issue. Okay. The lab downstairs, if you guys, we could, we could take a uh, kind of a, a, a field trip to the lab down, the environmental lab downstairs. And if you walk in there, especially if you get to the back, it smells like sewage. Where is it? The lab downstairs, the, the uh, environmental lab downstairs, C014, right? Where the lab is. And so the lab we took and so on. Smells like sewage. Anybody got an idea why it might smell like sewage? Think about it. Any idea? Well, first of all, number one, is that room under a negative pressure or a positive pressure? We've got eight hoods down there. Negative. So negative pressure is going to suck in air from somewhere, right? Now, I'm assuming that, you know, they should have sufficient fresh air to replace that lab hood. But my guess is, is that Either they really designed it in or they, uh, or the people that operate it don't really know what they're doing, which is a possibility also. So I'm going to assume for a moment it's under a negative pressure. It's going to pull air from wherever it can. So where might it pull air from that we might get a sewage smell? Are there any sinks in that room? A couple. There's one. There's one on every other table. And there's a couple in the back storage room. Anybody ever use those sinks? So they're dry. They're dry. The traps dry out, right? And when the traps dry out, you suck air back from the sewage system, right? You guys, have, if, if you guys uh, are ever look at a little bit of plumbing, you'll notice that all plumbing systems are vented. You don't want sewer gases to back up into a house, for instance. So the way you prevent that from happening is, is that you put in a stack, a, a uh, vent stack, a pipe, goes all the way up from the basement all the way up to the roof so that there's no air pressure or anything like that. It's just vented out to the open air. And you connect that to your sewage line so that if sewer gases come back, they will go up there. They back up, they'll go up there instead of coming into the building. But, you know, that's a long pipe. Maybe it'll come into the building anyway. To keep that from happening, every sink, every fixture has on its drain some sort of device to discourage gases from coming backwards. And if you look under the sink, it's got a trap. It's got a U-bend on the bottom so that the water has to go down, around, up, and down. So whenever you run water, there's always some water trapped in that trap. That water is, uh, resists the sewer gases backing up, so it encourages them to go up that stack instead of coming back through there. Now, you spend three or four months in the wintertime, the air's really dry. That trap dries out. There's no water in there anymore. So those sewer gases get sucked right back, will come out right through that drain from the sewer on the street all the way back up into, in through that drain. And if you get a room like that lab where there's one, two, three, four hoods operating 24 hours a day, you're sucking air out of that room. So that room's under a negative pressure, and it loves sucking gases out of the sewer. And if you go down there right now, walk into that door, you'll notice it as you walk in, but as you walk to the back, where the really infrequently used uh, uh, sinks are, then you it's like overwhelming. It's like you can't miss it. It's right, uh, uh, It's totally right. On our way out, maybe we'll stop in there. You can, you can sniff it. Okay, And maybe we'll really be good guys and run the water a little bit so we don't get that. Right. All you got to do in there is go in there every once in a while and run the water. And when we talk about, when we do the indoor air quality part, one of the major sources of, of uh, a lot of air conditioning mechanical rooms would have the Air conditioning units, they have floor drains. Same thing happens with them in the wintertime. The floor drains dry out. The trap in the floor drains dry out. The room's under a negative pressure, so they wind up sucking air and distributing it throughout the uh, area that they're supplying air to. And the building engineers, they know every once in a while, take a bucket of water and throw it down there to make sure that trap doesn't dry out. But that's neither here nor there. That's a little industrial ventilation and indoor air quality that we see in action right downstairs. 
we can sense by smelling it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. There are these things, and a lot of buildings have these things on every floor called slop sinks. And they're basically maintenance cabinets with a sink in them that rarely get used for anything. So maybe the cleaning crew might use one or two of them every once in a while. And they frequently have this problem. Okay. So at any rate, what you see behind me right now is my screen on my computer. This is accessible. If you notice the announcements on Blackboard, this, if you were at home or on a ski trip in the Catskills or, you know, Vernon Valley or, you know, or you were in, maybe you got really lucky you're in Colorado right now skiing. Maybe you're really unlucky. You got snowed in in Boston. Who knows, right? If you can't make it here, you can click on that link while we're in class, and you literally would get a live broadcast. A little bit of a delay. A few set. You would probably notice it if I had the sound turned up. A little tiny bit of a delay. But I mean, essentially, for anybody that's online, you'd, you'd uh, see a uh, 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 this screen, and you'd hear my voice as as I'm speaking right now. Uh, when you do it, you'll see a control panel over here. I have it folded in right now, but if you click that, it'll expand, and you can see also you can use that microphone and speakers on your computer, or you can use to listen, you can use a telephone, you gotta dial in, it's a, not a toll-free number, so you check to make sure you're using something that doesn't charge you for long distance. And uh, down here, there's a little chat box. You can actually type a message in here. You can direct that to everybody, so that everybody gets to see it who might be online. This is a small class, not gonna be that many people and at one time, or you can direct it directly to me so that it's a private message. For instance, you're the organizer, I guess, or yeah, you could just pick me out right there. Okay, so I'll know that you're logged on here, you know, because I'll see you here. I'll probably mute you, especially if, for instance, the reason why I'm bringing this up in such detail now is because uh, 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 both Grace and I are going to be possibly most, possibly, actually likely not going to be in town on Tuesday. We both have commitments. So we may be doing this class online, right? So you'll do it from at home. You'll be, uh, well, actually, you're going to be here because you got a class downstairs. I can arrange for ISID to set this up in this room so you can sit here in this room by yourself, I guess, I, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay because even if you're not available to watch it live, like right now I'm recording everything I'm saying, right? So you'll be able to watch this presentation uh, uh, as a recording later on, you can time shift and watch it later on as well. Okay. Now, presumably that won't happen very often, but there'll be times when you can't make it here and this may be pretty useful to you. Um, I actually put two links. I put one link in for the lecture portion of this, which is going to be mostly PowerPoint and another link in for the portion of this session. That's going to be kind of a lab exercise. We're actually going to work out problems or, or you're going to work out problems with me. Um, so, uh, so that's basically what you see. Anybody try and play back the, uh, the, the session from last week? Cause I put a link up to it. You tried it. Okay, yeah, good. It's on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. And you were able to play it right yeah. without a problem. Yeah, pretty much. If you can get it on YouTube, everybody can see it. So, so, uh, and they'll stay up there. The links will be on Blackboard. They'll stay up there for the whole semester. And there may be some stuff you might want to review for the exam. And when, when, they're, when they're recorded like that, you can also scrub through them so you don't have to listen to the whole thing, unlike when it's live. Uh, you can just go to the portions that you really want. So this is what you'll see there. I can, I'm going to move this out of the way, as you can. Okay, when you don't want. Uh, 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 it's going to be an in-class exam. Right, the the actual exam itself. So that you got to show up for. There's no way to take that like, you know, over the internet. I don't think that I haven't that I've thought of yet. So um, so now, next order of business, we have our manuals available. There's an industrial ventilation manual. There's a a, 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 a an indoor air quality manual. They're both written by Jeff Burton. He's kind of basically the guy in this kind of stuff. You see his materials everywhere. There's also a CD that comes with this. The CD has a bunch of spreadsheets on it where the spreadsheet is formatted in such a way that you can put in data and get the output out without having to actually do a lot of the uh, conversions and, and kind of like heavy calculation work if you want to avoid it. We're going to be learning in class by doing it ourselves. But with these spreadsheets available to you, you'll be able to use them on homework, during an exam, 
or so on and so forth to speed things up, make things easy, check check things for you and so on and so forth. If you don't know how to use them, if you're not careful and don't know how to use them, there won't be that much of a help to you. You got to really, you know, kind of follow us and understand, you know, what we're doing so you know which formulas to apply. There are many of them on a single spreadsheet. They're divided up basically to go with the chapters. There's also PowerPoints that he has put in, put together for each one of these chapters, for each session that we're having this week. And you can actually play those and you can get another lecture, an expert lecture, basically. Probably, you know, you can get, it's like getting Einstein to explain relativity to you. You know, you can have him as your teacher as well. So the books are there. Those are, that's our course material. You won't need any other manuals that you'll have to buy or anything like that. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that they're 160 bucks each plus shipping. And I'm doing my credit card on these things. So I'm going to pay for them on credit card. Um, I'm going to need you guys to pay me. Now, I can't take credit cards. Uh, if, you know, if you have an issue and you need to do it with credit or something like that, let me know and I'll work something out. But if you give me cash or, or, or a check or something like that, that will be fine. Okay, but you can take them tonight. I'm just going to ask you to sign for them or something like that. You know, so I know who took them, who didn't take them or whatever. Take them with you so you can start working with them and stuff like that. And hopefully next week or the week after you can bring in cash or a check or whatever. Okay, if you bring in cash, don't tell my wife. Okay, so I can keep that money and she won't know about it. You know, if you bring in checks, I'll, I'll have to put that in the bank. She'll know everything about it. And she'll probably want to know what the, what the $1,700 charge is for, for the 10 copies of this that we got. But, you know, I, I'll make something up on that. But at any rate, so that's where we stand. Okay, now I'll edit all this out for an lecture so she doesn't hear any of it also. So at any rate, so you won't, you'll, you'll actually be hearing the recording from this point on. So let's go get a look at this actual material that we're going through tonight. This is basically, I tell you what, let's distribute these right now. Okay, there's two, four, six, seven. Let's do it right now. So you'll have the books to work with as we go. Come on up. Okay, one of those, one of these, and one of these. Bingo. What do I sign? Yeah, I'll make them sheets. Okay. I'll get you before you leave. Yeah. One of these, one of these, and one of these. There you go. One's in, one's in air quality, and one is industrial ventilation. That's it. That's what we need for this course. I'll give you some of the readings that you may right. need, options, that readings. Be posted on Yeah, and there'll be stuff that's on right. accessible on the internet or or that I will, you know, copy for you or something like that, or, or find some way to distribute to you. Okay, tonight tonight we're we're going through chapter three of the in-depth industrial ventilation book. Are you taking chapter now? What's that? If you want to. If you're loaded and you happen to walk yeah. around with 100, I'm going to call it 170 bucks because yeah. I figure 100, uh, 10, 100 bucks for shipping. However, if it's less than that, I'll pay you back for the, you know, the difference. Uh, yeah, I will pay you back. Hang on a second. And if you have the money to pay for these things, you have more cash than the instructor does. You walk around with more money than the instructor does. Yeah. Okay. So what am I missing here? You know, hang on. There you go. Wait. Hang on to the money. We'll do it at the end. Of, we're going to stop. We're going to take a break halfway through, and we'll do it then. Okay. There you go. No, just make two different ones. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There you go. Good. Okay. Okay. So we're actually looking right now at chapter two of uh, chapter three of the industrial ventilation book. Okay, quick review last week. We started talking about what kind of hazards we might employ industrial ventilation in, uh, what, what uh, biological mist, vapors, and so on and so forth, silica, asbestos, lead, um, 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 the relationship to um, uh, uh, duct systems, the difference between dilution ventilation, uh, uh, exhaust ventilation. We really took kind of a really general look at this stuff. We didn't really get very specific with it. In fact, the chapter, we're going to look at chapter, I guess, three, and I guess maybe maybe a little bit of four. I think chapter four or five is, I think chapter four is actually spe is specifically on dilution ventilation. 
Uh, in industrial ventilation, we don't depend on dilution ventilation that much. Where our primary interest in is in capture or exhaust ventilation. Dilution ventilation, the physics and the math involved in dilution ventilation, is very much how pollutants are controlled, odors are controlled in indoor air quality environments. And since we're not going to be really looking at indoor air quality environments until later on in the semester, we're going to skip that chapter and go from three this week to five or six next week. Okay, characteristics there. We went through this. The important thing here is, is that very frequently we're going, to look, we're going to refer to standard temperature and pressure. And at standard temperature and pressure, room temperature, uh, normal pressure, which would be 760 millimeters of mercury or 14.7 uh, PSI at sea level and so on and so forth, um, uh, 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 we're going to be assuming for a lot of the problems that we're working with that to simplify things that the conditions meet that criteria. Now, it may be true that in real life, it, it might be a warm room and it might be 90 degrees instead of 70 degrees. It might be, uh, we might be doing work in Denver, which is 5,000 feet, a mile, a mile above sea level. And the density of the air is, is somewhat different, right? We're going to cross that bridge when we come to it. But a lot of these problems are going to assume standard temperature and pressure for the moment. Problem with this, the additional problem with this is, is that when we talk, talk about standard temperature and pressure, temperature could be Celsius, could be Fahrenheit. Uh, density could be English units, could be metric units, and so on and so forth. So it's conversion between uh, recognizing which units you're working in and conversion in units is going to be an important part of this course. It's going to be a really annoying important part of this course. We talked about last week that, that air is basically nitrogen and oxygen and a whole, a whole lot of trace gases including most notably for a lot of the stuff we're interested in, moisture, because moisture can cause its own issues, especially when we get to indoor air quality. And carbon dioxide, but we're not, we're not doing a course on, on, uh, on global warming, so we ain't going to be too concerned about that either. Anybody know anything about the satellite which, that may have been, I don't know if it went up or not, that may have been launched today? Space, you know what SpaceX is? SpaceX is a private corporation that launches uh, rockets. It's owned by a guy named uh, by the name of Elon Musk. Anybody know that name? It's, uh, he made all his money in PayPal, and he decided to go into these other technologies. He's kind of like almost like a Steve Jobs type of guy, except he's involved in a lot of different technologies. He started three companies after he sold uh, sold his share in PayPal. One of them is a solar energy company. They don't really make solar panels. They 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 install them and uh, basically uh, uh, do free installations, and then they charge for the energy that's generated from them, uh, which is a unique business model. He started Tesla, which is an electric car company, and they make a I don't know, you can only call it a spectacular electric car, really high end sports car. Uh, it's less than hundred thousand dollars, which a lot of you know, a lot of high-end sports cars cost more than that these days. But it's really a, a very high-performing sports car. Sport, uh, um, 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 it was named Car of the Year by uh, by um, uh, I forget which magazine does that um, uh, last year. Uh, I think it's the first electric car ever that, that won that award. But at any rate, very interesting guy. Today, his company SpaceX, which launches rockets into space and has a contract with NASA. You probably have seen it on TV every once in a while. They managed to make the first successful launch of a private rocket carrying a payload to the International Space Station. We have no way to get anything to the International Space Station, including, including personnel or equipment, now that uh, the shuttle program has ended. Our astronauts go up, go to Russia and use a the Soyuz capsule to get up to the space station and come back down. Meanwhile, we get equipment up there by using private lot rocket, launch, uh, rocket launches. And his launch, his rocket has gotten a contract for, I think, I don't know, 50 or 100 uh, missions or something like that after they managed to uh, come up with a couple of successful missions where – uh, they were able to demonstrate that they could do this. They, their Falcon 9 rocket right now is on Cape, it's Cape Canaveral that either launched or it didn't launch today. I'm not sure the weather conditions are kind of iffy. Um, and it has a, a, you know, a number of payloads, a couple of sat, you know, communication satellites and so on and so, so forth. And as a satellite that was, that I'm a little older than you guys, 
about 20 years ago, got got named the Gorsat. Anybody remember, recall that? May mean anything to you? Al Gore, vice president, tip, traditionally the vice president has responsibility for um, uh, ma- some management issues or public relations issues with NASA. You might have seen old movies like The Right Stuff and stuff like that where Lyndon Johnson was involved with the, the astronauts and their wives and the whole program and so on and so forth in the background. Uh, Al Gore, when he was vice president, was similarly involved. And he had an idea because he, he was uh, uh, kind of ahead of the curve uh, environmental. He had an idea that in order to uh, uh, increase people's perception about how small a planet this is and how we can have an effect on the planet globally, he proposed putting a satellite up that would um, uh, um, uh, would orbit uh, would would orbit would would be located a million miles from Earth, stationary, staying the same. Would actually move because the Earth is turning and moving. Would be basically stationary over the uh, over the sunlit side of the Earth, 24 hours a day, and beam back pictures of the earth from a million miles away. So you could actually, that picture you see traditionally of the moon, of the earth uh, uh, in the background from the moon, you could actually see that. You go on the internet and see that anytime you wanted to. Well, it got, uh, they actually built a satellite for $95 million, $100 million. Um, but it got it got buried in Congress. The Republicans called it Gorsat. They said they uh, uh, they, they wanted no part of it. They held up, uh, you know, for funding for launching it. and. Even beyond that, the shuttle program had had a couple of disasters, so they canceled a lot of flights and they were backed up with a lot of missions. So it wound up never being launched, and it was been in mothballs, basically, in a closet somewhere, a clean room or a closet at NASA for the last 15 years. Well, it turns out that we have two weather satellites that are vital to predicting for long-term predictions of severe weather storms that are past their expected life and could fail at any time. So they desperately need a replacement for them. But for one reason or other, the satellite, the, uh, the uh, uh, end of the uh, shuttle program or something like that, they weren't able to launch any more satellites to replace them. And they realized, well, we have this one sitting here that'll do exactly that. It'll take a picture of the Earth and we'll be able to see these weather systems forming. So it's on that rocket right now, getting ready to launch. So we may actually be able to see that. The other exciting thing about it is, is that part of their... Uh, uh, methodology is is that they want to recover these spent boosters so they can reuse them, make it more economical. And they tried this. They actually have this thing designed to land after it's after it's gone into space and released this satellite for this booster to come back and land on a platform out at sea. They tried this once already. It actually hit the platform, but it hit it too fast and it destroyed the booster. They, I think they're going to try it again on this one. So we might actually see a double whammy of this thing going up and the uh, and this thing actually landing on a, re-landing on a platform. So it'll be interesting to see that happen. So I've wasted a lot of time here. So let's move on. But anyway, that's going on right now. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Standard temperature and pressure. Okay, so now... One of the primary formulas that we're interested in is something to, if we call the ideal gas law. This is kind of a conglomeration of a lot of different things we know about uh, gases, from Avogadro to oil to you name it, a whole bunch of stuff. Basically, it says pressure times volume is equal to these quantities, N times R times T. N, P is pressure, V is volume. N is the number of moles, the quantity of a gas, the, the mass of a gas or quantity of a gas. Moles is the molecular weight in grams. So if you're talking about one mole of hydrogen, you're talking about two grams of hydrogen, right, H2. If you're talking about a benzene, benzene is C6H6. So that's 12 times 6 is, uh, 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 what, 92, uh, 60, 72 plus four plus six is 78 i presume i got that right i'm not sure so so 78 grams of uh, 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 uh benzene is one mole of benzene both of those at standard temperature and pressure two grams of hydrogen one mole and 78 grams of benzene take up the same amount of space they have the same number of molecules 
six times 10 to the 23rd molecules. They take up the same amount of space. Both of them take up 22 point, what is it, four liters. I'm having a senior moment. 22.4 liters of space, right? At standard pressure and standard temperature. That's the volume. Okay, so now if we have any given gas, like a gas, a certain amount of that gas, a mole, five moles, two moles, or three, then all the rest of these numbers in this formula will work for that gas. R is a gas constant. It's a number that, that takes care of all of the other variables that might be in here, including correcting for the various, uh, 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 um, uh, the various uh, measurements that we're using, pounds per square inch, of, so on and so forth. Right to, to, to make up for the volume, and whether it's in square inches, uh, in, in square, uh, in cubic inches, or cubic liters, or meet cubic meters, and so on and so forth. So what do we see here? N and R are fixed by the amount of gas and this can this constant that's universal to all gases. Okay, P and PV and T can vary. Right. So how do they vary? Well, if you increase the temperature then either the pressure and the, or the volume have to increase too because as one side of the equation increases, the other side's got to increase. Could be that the, if the volume is fixed, then the pressure has to increase. If the pressure is fixed, then the volume has to increase. There's a relationship between these three things, pressure, temperature, and volume. That's defined by this formula. And we're going to take advantage of that. Okay, um, um, says related to pressure and temperature to perfect grab. Okay, uh, pressure is equal to the density times R times T. What's the density? Density is really just the volume. It's just the uh, mass per unit volume. So V is in that formula. So this is another form of that formula. It's just been moved around a little bit. Uh, now, the air dens the density of air at standard temperature and pressure um, um, it has a certain uh, has a certain quantity. That density is determined by the pressure that it's under. Okay, now normally we're sitting here in air, and it doesn't seem like air in this space is under pressure because we live in this environment. And this pressure is static pressure. What do we remember about static pressure? It's exerted in all directions. It's in our lungs. It's, it's going in the same. It's pushing out our lungs. It's pushing in on our on our bodies and so on and so forth. So to us, our perception of it is that we're in zero pressure. And in fact, if we had a pressure gauge, what we would call, you know, like so many psi g or gauge would be zero. Gauge would read zero. But in reality, we're under 14.7 pounds per square inch. That pressure is generated by the weight of air above our heads. Okay. Now, if the air is warm. The air is lighter, right? So the pressure is lower. The air is pushed together less, so its density is less. There's less. It, it takes up more space for the same amount of same volume, same mass of air. It takes up less space because it's under less pressure and it can expand a little bit. So the density changes based on what the atmospheric pressure is. So the density of air is different here than it is on Mount Everest. And we're, we're going to use a formula. We're not going to recalculate this every time. It's going to be damn inconvenient to do this. So we're going to say that the actual density, the density where we happen to be on when the barometric pressure is very low or high, in other words, when the war when there's warm air or cold air on us, cold air is very heavy, so it tends to uh, barometric pressure tends to be higher. Um, uh, on those days, if we really wanted to be accurate, the actual uh, 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 density is going to be equal to the density at standard temperature pressure times some differential factor that we're going to multiply it by. And that differential factor is going to be based on temperature and some other factors. We'll actually look at that in a second. So rather than to calculate this, you know, by, by using this original formula every time we want to do it, we're going to have, we're going to use a table to actually do it for us. And we're going to have, we have actually exercises to do that with later on. Another, another variable of this formula, another variant, uh, uh, vari uh, variance of this formula is to take, remember, pressure and volume were on one side, temperature were on the other side. Well, you can kind of put them both on the same side and say pressure times volume over the temperature of a, ga a quantity of gas is going to be equal to, if you change any one of those factors, is going to be equal to the pressure, new pressure, 
times the new volume times the new temperature. So if you increase the temperature from, if you change the temperature uh, from temperature one to temperature two, it's going to affect the pressure and the volume of that gas. And we can use this, this formula very directly to determine, well, if the if uh, 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 in state one, if we start out with standard temperature and pressure, and we have one liter of air at uh, atmospheric pressure, 14.7 pounds, and it happens to be 20 degrees centigrade, and now we increase that temperature to 40 degrees, well, we know it's going to affect the top half of that formula. And we can actually use this equation to calculate how it affects the pressure or the volume. And we're gonna, we have an example of that that we're going to play with. Okay, so um, I'm not going to actually do run it through here. We'll do it when we get to our examples. Uh, now, air movement is caused by differential pressures. The reason why air moves through a duct is because it's moving from an area where the pressure is higher to a place where the pressure is lower. When heat moves, moves from a place where the, press, the, the temperature is higher to a place where the temperature is lower, right? Take heat away from something. Um, uh, so just like that, we're whenever we see a lower pressure than an adjoining area, we know air is going to move in that direction, especially when we're working with ducts. Now, in a duct, there's two kinds of pressures that we're concerned with. One of them is static pressure. And static pressure is the pressure that is present all the time, acts in all directions. If there's no fan operating in the duct, the static pressure is 14.7, the absolute static pressure is 14.7 pounds absolute or zero PSI absolute. Pressures in ducts are not much different than, than standard pressures, right? Because we really, in a duct, in a large duct or something like that, it's hard to build up a lot of pressure. It's not like we're filling a cylinder under hundreds or thousands of pounds of pressure like we might fill a cylinder with nitrogen or carbon dioxide or something like that. So the pressure differences between one side of a fan and another side of a fan are not that great. And we need an easy way to measure them. So the easy way that we use to measure them is instead of using PSI, or uh, uh, some other metric measurement, is we say, well, that pressure, how much, uh, how much is that difference in pressure, uh, how can I relate that to the weight of a column of water? So you guys have seen these columns. I don't, unfortunately, didn't bring my graphics tablet, I can't draw. So I'm going to have to hope that we have something here that's going to illustrate that for you. Here's a duct, right? So in this duct, the, the furthest to the right, the tube that's furthest to the right, it's a simple U-tube, right? And there's a fan in there, there's a fan in this duct, the fan's blowing air to the right. So everything that's on this side of the fan is under a negative pressure relative to the other side of the fan, right? This is the low pressure side, the fan's pushing stuff, so it's sucking stuff through here, there's the low pressure side, the air is going to go towards the higher pressure the other side of the fan. Okay, so now... This first, this, the furthest to the right, this tube, just a simple, could be a simple plastic tube. Now, if that fan is not running, the pressure on the side of that tube, which is open to the side of the duct, is 14.7 pounds, the same static pressure that's going on all over the world. On the other side, it's also 14.7 pounds. So that tube levels itself out. The height of that tube, the height of that water in that tube is the same height. No matter, why, no matter what's happening in the rest of the world, right? When that fan goes on, the downstream side of that, the, up, the, the upstream side of this fan becomes negative. The pressure becomes negative. So you can imagine that's going to start sucking. It's going to suck air through the duct, but it's also going to pull with equal vigor air up through that tube. Since there's water in that tube, it's going to draw that water up. Now, if there were enough suction there, it would suck the water right out of the tube. But most duct systems and fans don't really generate that big a difference in pressure. So what will happen is it will pull that water up until the difference in the heights of the column of that water, uh, that weight of water that's different between one side and the other, is equivalent to the suction on that side of the duct. And we, we call that inches of water of, uh, of vacuum or of pressure. 
So the static pressure here is negative one inch of water. Okay, we could have called that PSI. We could have called it a million other things. This is a really convenient way for us to describe this. Okay, so static pressure acts in all directions. You have static pressure in a balloon and you blow it up, right? In every part of it, the pressure is the same and it's acting um, uh, uh, in every direction possible. Oh, thank you. I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, that's good. Oh, good. Terrific. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. So now the other kind of pressure that we can get, the other kind of pressure we can get, if you look at the one to the far left, right? That's called velocity. Uh, but I'm not, let, me, let me stop right here. Let's look at the middle one first. Now, we take that tube. Instead of putting it up against the side of the duct, we run it in the duct, and we point it in the direction of the airflow. So now we get air blowing into that duct. We get something called pressure that's caused by the velocity or movement of the air, velocity pressure. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, that's not just pressure from the movement of the air. We just said static pressure is acting there all the time anyway. So that pressure is really both velocity pressure and static pressure added together. Make That makes sense, you guys? Anybody uncomfortable with that? That's both pressures because you always have static pressure in that. that whether you're, you point, even if you pointed it downstream, you would still have static pressure. Right? Point it upstream, you have that. If you point it downstream, you would have only static pressure. If you point it upstream, you would have the static pressure plus the pressure from the velocity of air. Okay? So that is static pressure and velocity pressure added together. That's called total pressure. So if you wanted to know only what the pressure was from the movement of the air in this duct, you would have to take what you see there from that total pressure and subtract the static pressure from it, okay? So the total pressure is, uh, is three inches, right? The static pressure is one inch. What do you think the velocity pressure is? I'm sorry, the total pressure is 0.3 inches. The static pressure is one inch. What do you think the, uh, total, the velocity pressure is? The difference between the two, right? Oh, uh, things are going to be a little complicated here. Right? The velocity pressure is 0.7 inches, right? Yeah, You're uncomfortable with that? No, 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 I'm thinking minus. I'm just at a point yeah, I'm well, you want to know something. It is minus because the velocity pressure, now, 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 uh, the velocity, the total pressure, the negative pressure, negative pressure, hang on a second. Ta -ta. No, notice that uh, it, it can be negative. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Velocity, that can be negative. That, well, the velocity pressure is going to be positive because the air is moving into it. That's always going to be a positive number. But the total pressure can be negative. It's possible for the total pressure to be negative. Let's take a look back here. Okay, here's a duct. And we're looking upstream and downstream on this duct. The velocity pressure is the same downstream and upstream because it's only the pressure that's caused by the air flowing into that tube. And since the duct's the same size, it's going the same speed, it's going to be the same pressure. So the velocity pressure downstream in the fan and upstream in the fan are not only the same, they're both positive. Okay? Everybody comfortable with that so far? Okay, what about the static pressure? You know, the static pressure upstream before the fan is negative because it's under a suction. After, it's positive. Right? Because because it's, uh, uh, the fan is pushing air through. So imagine if we put that tube there, it would go the opposite direction. Air would push down on the tube instead of suck up on the tube. Next week, not next week, we're not going to be here next We probably won't be here together next week. The following week, we're going to go down to the lab for a half an hour. We're going to set up a fan and a duct, and we're going to do this. So we actually see this work. Okay, so, so, so the, st the static pressure on one side is negative. On the other side, it's positive. Well, what about the total pressure? What do you think might happen there? Well, in general, the total pressure upstream is going to be negative. Total pressure downstream is going to be positive, or at least relative to each other, because that's what makes the whole thing go, right? Pressure's got to be lower on one side than on the other side. That's what makes it actually work. 
Okay, so don't get too worried about that yet. We'll we'll work through this a million times. The next problem we have is that there's there, there's friction on the sides of these ducts. It's not a perfect environment. If you looked at the right side of this of the movement of air in this in this uh, diagram, you might call that something called laminar flow. The flow is perfectly even through this ductwork. As far as ducts are concerned, this never happens. The air would have to move so slowly that for this to happen, that in effect we really never deal with laminar flow. On the left hand side, you see what reality is. What's happening is is that the air is being affected by friction on the sides of the duct. So it's moving more slowly. There may be eddy currents building up in there that change the direction and interfere with the movement of air. And in fact, the, 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 uh, uh, the velocity of the air moving through the duct is fastest through the middle and slowest at the ends. Okay, And what does that tell you about the velocity pressure? It's highest in the middle and lowest at the sides. Right? So velocity pressure and velocity are directly related to each other. Velocity pressure is caused by how fast the air is moving. The faster the air is moving, the higher the velocity pressure. Okay, we have a couple of formulas, one in US units, one in uh, uh, metric units on how to calculate this. And this is a simplification of what the real measurements are of this, but the velocity of the air is equal to 4,005 times the square root of the velocity pressure over a density correction factor that that uh, d is the density correction factor now if this is standard pressure and temperature that that d is one so it's just the square root of the square root of the correct for it then uh, uh if d is 0 0.8 like in other words the air is only eight tenths the density of air in, at standard temperature and pressure like where we're at the base camp on the himalayas or something like that where we have a duct not likely to have a duct on base camp in the Himalayas, I guess. But if you had one, then that density might be eight tenths of what it is at sea level, and we might be dealing with a very different situation for this for the effect of this velocity. So that's how we would use the calculation. We divide by 0.8. We're going to see a table that helps us with that in a, in a few moments. Okay. And if you don't know the dense, if you don't know the correction factor, but you do know the density, you can use a second formula to calculate it from the density. This may come up because you may be, you, we might give you a problem or something like that where you would use it. Now you have two formulas. So if we give you the density, you can use one. If you give you the, uh, 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 the correction factor, density correction factor, you can use the other. Again, total pressure, static pressure versus velocity pressure. Velocity pressure is equal to total pressure minus the static pressure. Use it any way you want. Okay, so now... Talk about air moving through a duct. Q represents the volume of air moving through a duct. That's, cu that's usually cubic feet per minute or per second. V is the velocity of the air. A is equal to the area, that the cross-sectional area of the ductwork. To put it simply, if you have a duct that's 12 inches by a square duct, 12 inches by 12 inches, that's one square foot. If air is moving through there at 100 feet per minute, right? That means for every minute, you got 100 cubic feet of air moving through there. 100 feet per minute times one square foot is 100 cubic feet per minute. If the area were two square feet, 100 feet per minute velocity going through two square feet now would be 200 cubic feet per minute. Simple enough, right? Okay, so we're interested in the area, cross-sectional area of the ductwork and the velocity of air going through it. If you know the quantity uh, and you know the area, you can calculate the velocity that the air is moving through it. And we're really interested in the in, in we we need to know volume because we got to design these systems. We got to need to know how much air, what kind of fan we need, what kind of what kind of air movement we got to produce. We need to know velocity because whatever this contaminant is that we're going to deal with and we want to remove, we got to capture it, and we're going to use that by using the velocity of air. Okay, so. Um, the units, we can play around with the units. I'm going to try as much as possible to st stick with U.S. units because that's the way air conditioning mechanics work. That's the way most industry works in the United States. That's the way air conditioning mechanics works. Occasionally, we may throw in some stuff where you got to work with metric units just so you're prepared for it. But most of the time, I'm going to use U.S. units. 
What volume of air is being drawn into a laboratory hood opening measuring 12 inches by 24 inches if the average phase velocity is 200 feet per minute? Hazard a guess? What's the square foot of the air? What, what's the area, cross-sectional area of the ductwork? 12 by 24 is, right? First of all, convert it to feet, right? One foot by two foot. Two square feet, right? Velocity is 200 feet per minute. How many cubic feet per minute are we moving? 200 times 2, 400 cubic feet per air. Q is equal to the velocity times the cross-sectional area. Just remember that inches, you want to change inches to feet right away because since we're using feet per minute and the rest of it, we need uniform measurements, right? Okay, there you go. Okay, now here's another duct. Now, not all duct work in a system is going to be the same size. Okay, so for instance... Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, this is circular duct as it happens. Circular duct is a little bit more complicated because uh, we have a formula that we have to use to calculate the area. It's not as simple as A times B as it is with a rectangle or a square. Uh, it's pi times the diameter squared over four or pi R squared, right? So it's another way to look at it. Pi R squared. Okay. The radius squared. So for, for our, for argument's sake, I'm going to say that V1, right, velocity 1 is 200 feet per minute. Area 1 is 1 square foot, whatever that diameter would have to be. Uh, what's, uh, let's say that area 2 is 4 square feet. What's velocity 2 going to be equal to? A1 was uh, 100 feet per minute, 1 square foot. A2 is 4 square feet. What's V2 going to be? Is it going to slow down or speed up? It's going to slow down, right? And the area is four times as much as what we started with. So it was 100, square, it was 100 feet per minute. So it's going to be 25 feet per minute, right? And if V1 times A1 is a 1 times 100 is 100 cubic feet per minute, V2 is V2 times A2, which is 4 square feet, so V2 times 4. Divide both sides by 4. V is equal to 25. We'll get, we're going to get on to this uh, a point where I'm really sorry I don't have my, my uh, 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 graphics tablet with me. But basically, that's what we're going to be. That's one of the simplest. Right now, it's a simple application. We're going to wind up doing much more complicated problems with this as you get used to doing these calculations. Um, one of the other things we're interested in is we're interested in capturing contaminants. Not all of those contaminants are going to be gases. A lot of times those contaminants are going to be particles. Particles have mass. So we have to understand what the properties of these particles is. And most of the properties of most of the dynamics of small particles, this may have come up in other courses, is based on the size. In other words, you're not so concerned really about the density of the particle directly, but more you can kind of make assumptions. When you're dealing with, with small particles, make a lot of assumptions based on the size of the particle without worrying quite as much about what the real density of that particle is. So we're going to use some formulas for calculating this formula, Vs, is the settling rate of a particle. D is the diameter in microns of the particle, right? Then we have a constant. 0 0.0052, and specific grav. Okay, uh, uh, SG is specific gravity, <coughs> is unitless. Of uh, uh, water is one. So if it's an aerosol or something like that, if it's water, then basically we don't multiply it by anything. Uh, if it's some other substance that has a, it's denser or lighter than water, then we would use it there. But notice that d, the particle diameter, is squared. Changes in the diameter have a much bigger influence on the settling rate of the particle than the actual density of the particle has, right? Because that property is squared. Okay, and we're going to, this is just another formula that we're going to be able to apply. But you understand why we're so interested in that particular property, because a lot of times we want to capture these things. Uh, a couple of definitions. Capture velocity. We got particles and junk like that in the air we want to capture. The velocity that you need to get that particle and pull it into your exhaust hood is called a capture velocity. Seems pretty obvious. Now, once it's in the ductwork, 
You don't want it to settle out. You want to get rid of it. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of that crap build up in your ductwork. You need to maintain a certain transport velocity. Okay. The minimum velocity you need to keep it moving through the ductwork is called the trans is the transport velocity. Okay. So some of the issues we're going to wind up with is that that turbulence that we were talking about, the friction from the sides of the ductwork, is going to influence these things because we have a fan in this system, but we may have a long run of ductwork. I mean, we may have turns in this ductwork. We may have a certain uh, geometry to our hood. I mean, we have filters in there and so on and so forth. All these various devices, they, they increase friction or they slow down the air movement. They affect the air movement. So they all impede. So if we have a long, long run of ductwork, right? And we have, if we have a short run of ductwork, long run of ductwork, the geometry otherwise is the same, same fan, same diameter, and so on and so forth. We may not be able to move air as efficiently or quickly. We won't have the same velocity if we have that long run of ductwork because that's a lot of resistance to the movement of the air. Okay, local exhaust ventilation. That's what, that's what our business is. That's what you, you guys right now, you can forget about being MPHs. Right now in this class, your EOHMS guys, right? Because your business is to make sure that contaminant it does not affect the worker. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to capture those contaminants right at the source so they don't get out into the room, so that the worker doesn't breathe them, he isn't exposed to them. That's your job. You are no longer an MPH. As you can be an MPH in another class. In this class, you're going to be industrial hygienist for, for a little while. Anyway, we'll be, we'll be, maybe for some sessions, we'll be MPH people. But for the most part, we're going to be industrial hygienists here. Okay. Um, 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 uh, uh, generally, there, this, um, I don't know if the, this statement's usually true. Not always true. Generally, you will design these hoods because the worker's working at a station. He's working here soldering you know, um, uh, Android boards, you know, for, you know, he's in China, he's making iPhones or something like that. He's soldering. Uh, he's, uh, in another plant and he's grinding parts for, uh, cases and stuff like that. He's another plant and he's, uh, working with tanks of solvents for cleaning, uh, uh, bumpers that are going to be chrome plated or something like that. He's going to be working in a station at the same station all the time. Generally it's a fixed station. The hood is fixed designed for him to work in that environment and to pull these exhaust gases away from. That's generally the situation. Occasionally, it's a little bit different. You may have been on jobs where you've seen welders work. Sometimes wel welding fumes are very, very tiny particles. Now, you see he wears a mask. He may have a respirator and so on and so forth. These fume particles are super tiny, right? So respirators, tiniest leak or something like that, it's going to breathe this stuff, right? So so you may have seen these guys use a rig where they have an exhaust, they have a, a, a device with a filter and an exhaust fan in it, and ductwork, maybe six or eight inch ductwork, goes up to kind of a movable arm, like a robotic, almost like a robotic arm that he can grab and, and pull, and it's got a exhaust hood on it, a shrouded exhaust hood that he can pull up right to the place where he's welding something, and turn that fan on, and it sucks that material away from him. And he can move that into the next room if he's welding pipe in the next room. And he can man manipulate that so that if he's got to work on this side, it's pulling the particles away from him. So it's not always true, but generally true that you're working at a fixed location with a fixed hood. Uh, local exhaust ventilation usually provided when overexposure is a hazard may, may occur. In other words, in industry, if they don't need to spend the money, you're not going to spend the money. So usually you see a hood in a situation where there's a serious chance of exposure, right? If it's a kind of a situation where um, uh, in our shop they use some a dilute acetic acid solution and, you know, it smells kind of like a salad half the time, right? But they don't work in that area very often and his exposure is probably well below the permissible exposure limit. So... They may not, they don't have a very form, they have a, they have a, 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 an informal, they have a small exhaust hood over it, kind of captures stuff as it goes up because it's warm solution, the air rises, captures most of it, and controls the odors and stuff like that, but they don't really have a really good, well-designed hood 
to capture everything and take it away from them because they think it's well, they're basically, based on their measurements, it's well below the permissible exposure limit for that material. But when you may be close, you need something like, you need to capture all of this material. And if it's a really hazardous material, welding fumes could be, depending on the material, you really need to capture this stuff. So typically the setup is going to be a hood. It's going to be something to take the junk that you capture out of the air. Could be activated charcoal if it's a VOC. It could be a filter device of some kind or another. Could be a scrubber uses a water spray to scrub stuff out of the air. Why are you doing that? Because if it ain't any good for the work, a chance that it ain't much good for your fan either. And I'm going to hazard a wild guess: your neighbors aren't going to be in love with the crap either, right? So you have a few issues there. So very frequently, between the hood and the fan, there is some sort of cleaning device, some sort of device to remove the contaminate that may be objectionable in the exhaust air. It could be just odors, could be an odor problem or something like that. And then to an exhaust, then it is usually exhausts outdoors. Now, if you're sucking air out of the room and sending it outside, you can't create a vacuum in that room. This is not going to work unless you supply replacement air for that room. Okay, if you don't supply replacement air, that fan is not going to, you're not going to get the air moving as much as you want. Again, typical exhaust uh, ventilation system. Okay, yeah, there's a few pictures, right? Uh, this is an axial, that device is a fan. There's a fan actually buried in there. Um, general ventilation fan, this might, the one on the right might be uh, something you might see in a roof of a plant or something like that, just to get dilution ventilation. Uh, this branch duct goes off at a 45 degree angle instead of a 95 degree angle because there's less friction involved in moving air through that angle. Uh, there's a whole bunch of filters there. I can see one's activated charcoal. One is one is a pleated, looks like fiberglass filter and so on. Uh, cyclone dust collector. What that basically does is as you pull air through it, it goes through, the air goes into and out of a device that spins the air very quickly. So if the particles have some mass, they're going to be thrown to the outside or the inside, collect down at the bottom. Any of you guys, uh, how many of you guys have taken the, uh, the uh, EOHS lab course? Right. You remember you used, those guys remember that they use a cyclone on an air sampling device so that they can measure particulate levels, right, that were under a certain size. Um, it basically was a pump, a filter that you pre-weighed, and you would suck air past that filter and then re-weigh that filter to see how much of that dust you picked up. Well, they use a cyclone before that filter. And that cyclone, as you pull air through it, would spin the air and the larger particles would get caught in that cyclone and drop down to the bottom. Only the smaller particles would come through. So you could then use the same system to measure respirable part particulates, particles below four microns, because that cyclone was the, that little cyclone was designed that at that flow rate that it wouldn't allow it would capture all the particles above four microns. And that's, that's kind of what it looks like in the beginning. You actually do collect things very, pretty effectively. Um, okay, here's some more duct transitions. That's just changes in, say, shape or size. Flexible duct, which is really obnoxious stuff. Blast gate, we, when we look at our equipment downstairs, that's a kind of a damp or shut off, turn on or shut off flow. Um, they're not really designed for regulating flow as much as a regular damper, like kind of like these things you see actually mounted, uh, actually mounted. Uh, but it's really intended for turning on and off, but you can use it to regulate flow as well. It's basically, it blocks the duct or blocks some part of the duct to slow the air movement down. We're going to be using that ourselves. Okay. Okay, so let me see what we really need to look at here. One last thing. There is a number called the Reynolds number. This is something we can calculate. The Reynolds number is a calculation that indicates to you whether the flow in this system is turbulent or laminar. What did we say about laminar before? Laminar is, has no eddy currents. It's nice and even and so on and so forth. You can imagine to have that kind of flow through a duct, you would have to be moving pretty slowly, right? Turbulent flow, oh, the air is mixing up and blowing all over the place and it's different velocities. It's faster in the middle and slower in the sides and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, that's caused by friction with the sides. It's also caused by bends and transitions and obstructions and screws and nails and everything else. 
right? So you can actually calculate the Reynolds number. We actually, we have some formulas for doing that, but to make a long story short on the Reynolds number, um, 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 let me give you an example here. Uh, most loan document for a thousand cubic feet, a uh, thousand cubic feet per minute, uh, uh, cubic feet per minute of air flowing in a 12 inch duct generates a Reynolds number of 130,000. Um, a, um, uh, uh, let's see, a, a, um, a clean room duct that uses very low velocity air, 90 feet per minute generates a uh, Reynolds number. If you do the calculation, that's above there, that number you see above there, that gives you a Reynolds number of 12,000. What did we say about this? Laminar flow is under 2,000, right? What would they define from Reynolds numbers, laminar flow? Between 2,000 and 4,000 is kind of in between, right? And above 4,000 is basically you treat it as turbulent flow. So basically, we're never going to run into a system most likely that's laminar flow. We're always going to be dealing with turbulent flow. And we can demonstrate that with the if we somebody wants us to, you know, we can demonstrate that with these with this calculation for Reynolds number, which is based on the diameter, the volume, the density, and so on and so forth, the viscosity of the fluid that you're. These are all fluid. By the way, a lot of the stuff that we're saying that Q equals V A, the a lot of this other stuff, this applies to almost any fluid. It applies to water or oil just as much as it applies to air. It's just another kind of fluid. The main difference with air is that air is compressible, where a lot of these other fluids aren't compressible. So, uh, they, in fact, in some ways, that makes them simpler. And these are numbers that represent the roughness or the friction that's generated by different materials. We're not going to really use this chart. We're going to use a different chart that's actually designed for ductwork. Typical uh, local exhaust system ventilation. Uh, to give you an idea over here, the fan is down at the end. The static pressure, remember that suction pressure? That's what's driving stuff here. Static pressure is three inches, minus three inches at the fan. In other words, it's sucking so hard, if we put a hole in there, put a tube up on it, it would support a three-inch column of water. Okay, well, if you go back below, before the, if you go back, you have a bend over here. If you go back before the bend, uh, it's down to 2.6 inches. Where did that, where'd you lose that suction? You lost it to friction in this duct because of that bend. And then if you go back before the filter, it's 1.6, right? If you go, if you follow the duct down and you make a turn over here, now it's down to 1.2. And at the hood, uh, uh, or in this duct, it's 1.2. At the actual hood itself, it's, it's very low because the hood is large relative to the size of the duct. And so what does that tell you? That tells you if you got a large hood, you better be moving air pretty effectively through this ductwork in order to make sure you got some velocity at that hood so you can capture stuff, right? So we're going to actually, we'll be doing this stuff. This is a version of a diagram, a version of this diagram where what they've done is, is that they've charted what the suction pressure is. Suction pressure, total static pressure drop uh, was over here was at the fan. This is where it was at the fan, minus six inches. And then there's some, uh, and then before the, uh, this system, it's, it's uh, four, negative four inches and so on and so forth. And by the time you get to the hood, it's about one inch of suction at the hood. Okay, so this charts the loss of suction pressure going back from the fan to the hood. They just did what they did with numbers here. They did graphically here. That's the only difference here. That's not different numbers, but that's, that's the basic difference. Okay, this situation. Where would you think there's more turbulence and more loss of suction pressure? It's going to be at this curved portion, at the uh, uh, squared off portion, right? You got turns, transitions. You want to make them as smooth a uh, transition as possible. Okay, spray painting booth. Yes, you have spray painting booth here. That whole wall against the back there is a basically a, uh, a suction, a hood, and uh, those filters capture the paint dust. So they don't get pushed, they don't get pulled into the uh, system. Now, notice he's on one side of the car. You're going to stand on the other side of the car, you're going to get blasted with this stuff. Uh, here's a, um, a, a table saw. As the material gets uh, 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 cut up, it gets thrown up into that exhaust. It does completely cover it so that horse, as you're pushing it through, that lifts a little bit. The wood, the wood actually uh, uh, keeps, it, keeps a seal on it. 
so you uh, you don't need to move that much air because it's captured within that it, it contained within that hood anyway. Okay, here's a uh, system of vats here, a plating operation. Now usually these vats are heated, right? So what's going to happen is is that that warm air is going to rise, so they have the hoods up above it. Now, if you're a worker and you're leaning over that, that ain't helping you very much because it's pulling it right past you. And those hoods are so far up, they're probably not very effective anyway. Okay, how could this be improved? Well, get that hood down over those tanks for starters, right? There's also, we're going to learn about other kinds of hoods that are used in these kind of systems. If they're not heated, you might be better off with something called a slot hood at the back of these tanks. But we'll talk about that as the semester goes on. Okay, that asks you for questions. I'm not answering questions, so too bad. Now, these are the questions that we, that we really need as we go through the, uh, the uh, exercises. Okay, so let's take a, a, a guy we have, I, uh, we printed out the questions for you. Okay, these are exercises. These exercises are actually the questions that are at the end of the, that are, uh, that are in your workbook. So you'll see these same questions in your workbook. At the end of each chapter, you're going to find the answers to these questions. Okay, so you can work through this workbook on your own and, you know, try and, do the, try and solve the problems as you go through. There's examples and there's exercises. The exercises you can try and then go to the end of the chapter to see if you got it right. But we're actually going to do these today here uh, to get us kicked off on it. Okay, now the way this Jeff Burton, I talked to him the way, come on up. Come on up. Take a break for a couple of minutes. Take a quick look through this stuff. You can actually compare it to your, uh, to your, here you can get that to press that. Okay. Yep. There you go. He's got it. Uh, leave one for me if you got it. Yeah, you got Is there an extra? Good. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, we also have here, oh, good. Okay, I'm going to give these out also. Yeah, this time I'll get up. Now you guys can stay there. Okay. There, take that. Leave one for me. There you go. Okay, these are tables from the back of your book as well. Okay, what's that? Uh, well, you, you're gonna need the book. Trust me. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in these books. All right, so I'm gonna take five minutes, so you can just take a quick look at them, and I'm gonna get started on the next section of this. And I'm gonna use the other links. 